Section 6 of A Bunch of Keys, Where They Were Found and What They Might Have Unlocked, A Christmas Book, edited by Tom Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. The Key of the Piano, Part 2, by Thomas Archer. Once again in London I spent much time in seeking this man. Outside the doors of the fashionable clubs and the parks, at the gardens of pleasure and the theatres, and among the audiences of concerts where I myself played, I looked in vain. At last, in three months' time, I learned that he had been in a distant part of England and was shortly expected back previous to his wedding in the high life, was Adeline, daughter of Sir Joseph. From France I had heard but once, except through Mina, who said that he was still an invalid, looking forward to the coming spring to restore him to strength. His letter to me enclosed one addressed to her who had so betrayed him and as it was left open for me to read, and I was requested to deliver it and to make known the answer to him, I knew its contents and what it must have cost him to write. It reminded her of all that she had said to inspire with hope his soul, of the night when she had so cruelly wounded him, of what had been said between them, and of the portrait and the lock of hair which he still wore near his heart. One hope he still cherished, that she had spoken those words in fear of the Sir Joseph, and with a shame to reveal the love she bore him. Let her but so explain those words, and he would be happier, even though he died before the spring. This letter I took to the house, demanding to see its well-born mistress, and was presently taken to where she sat writing at her little desk, in the very balcony where they had so parted, and where, during the absence of the family, the stonework had been mended. After reading the letter which I placed in her hand, with a curling lip and something like a frown, she turned upon me and said, Do you know the writer of this? I do, said I, and he is my dearest friend. Indeed, she said, looking at me still more steadily. Is he really likely to die? He is, I replied, scarcely trusting myself to speak, so did her cold manner enrage me. I am very sorry to hear it, she said then a little more gently, he should not have been so foolish, but I pity him greatly. Is there no answer for me to send him from you? I asked, still controlling myself. None whatever. Neither in word nor writing? I have no answer to give and shall be compelled to bid you good morning. One word, madam, I cried and I will say good morning with pleasure. Can you give me the address of Lord George? Lord George who? I know him by no other name. You know who it is that I mean. What do you want with it? I desire to wait on him, madam, and I can then inform him of my business. He will not fight you, if that is what you mean. I expect not, madam. He would fear to fight any man except in an advantage. But Franz Wilhelm is my brother, and I will avenge him wherever I may meet his murderer, for he will die, and either Lord George or I must die too. You can easily use such a threat here now. You see, I am only a lady, and therefore I am not expected to fight. Pardon, madam, I had indeed forgotten. You have to me given no evidence of womanliness, and I therefore felt not bound to regard your sex. One word more. 
to you also this cruel deed will come home, for the France be living or dead. For I have vowed that I will seek out Lord George if he is to be found, and I will keep my word. So I left her, and not daring to write Franz any other message than that I had delivered his letter, and that the lady, who spoke of him sorrowfully, had given me no reply. I waited, waited two months more to hear that Franz was weak, and as Mina thought, sinking daily. I had so greatly neglected my friends of the profession that I was much surprised to find when I got home one night an old acquaintance staying for me in my room, still more surprised to hear the errand upon which he came. There was to be a grand assembly at the house of a gentleman just out of London, and of the band which he had been commissioned to secure, there wanted but one instrument the one which I played. He himself would not be present, but it would be a personal favor notwithstanding. I had given up attending any concerts but those of the public, especially when no friends of mine were members of the band. But I asked him where was the house to which we were invited. Judge me the surprise of hearing that it was the Sir Joseph's. In the moment I accepted the engagement, it was for the next night, since it would perhaps bring me face to face with the man I sought. My friend's card in my pocket was my letter of introduction to the conductor of the band. It was for me to take care that neither the servants nor the daughter of the house recognized me as the brother of France. It would have been impossible. I shaved my beard and colored my fair hair and mustache with black dye at the shop of a German barber well known to me. Then, full of determination but anxious, I went to the house in company with some others who met at the appointed place. There was again a large and brilliant party, many of them I remembered to have seen there before. And still the daughter stately moved about the room, receiving the guests as she leaned on the arm of her white-haired father. Her face, badly beautiful ever, still bore the same dark, mocking, cruel look, but with even more of defiance, and it had grown older and sterner, as though a hidden care at her heart gnawed constantly. I could scarcely suppress myself as I saw the Lord George come in, the marks of an evil life still deeper in his eyes and on his wrinkled brow. As she moved about the rooms, he followed her with suspicious eyes and no longer stooped over her chair to make jokes. He spoke little, and when he addressed her, she seemed to me to sneer. There was no happiness in the prospect of their married life then, and should I kill him, she would little grieve. The evening passed on with music and dancing, when the rooms were crowded with richly dressed ladies, sparkling with jewels, and with a few gentlemen who had yet come in, for they expected fresh arrivals as late as twelve o'clock, and those already there were mostly old city friends of the master of the house. Supper was to be served at one o'clock, and I had determined to take the first opportunity after supper, while the gentlemen were finishing their wine, after the ladies had left the table, to insult Lord George before them all. His immediate strength I feared not, and if he challenged me I chose the saber which I knew. Should he accept my challenge? He could have the pistol of which I knew but little. I had just concluded with myself this, when there was a lull in the room, one of those quiet moments, something of the mysterious, which fall on all assemblies. Lord George was leaning with his elbow on the mantelpiece, and with his back to the fire. 
So Joseph was talking to a little group of bald-headed gentlemen at a corner. A knot of dames around the daughter, asking her to play to them. She hesitated, and I saw it. I noticed that for a moment her face was disturbed, but presently Lord George went to the piano and opened it, and then went back to his station by the chimney. She sat down to the instrument, and even as she ran her fingers along the keys, a strange and startling change came over her. Her face became fixed, pale and corpse-like. Her eyes dilated, Un stared before her, immovable. Her breath came and went as though some sudden fear had seized her, and then she began to play. I have said that she was a mere drawing-room pianist, and knew that at her best she could not touch the keys for the rapid and brilliant movement which now seemed easy to her. With a few bars of wild prelude, she struck suddenly into that very harmony which poor Franz had played on the night where she stood there beside him, and with even more effect. As the glorious music rolled forth, and the steam burst into brilliant and more varied cadence, the guests held their breath and their talk died out in a burst of suppressed admiration and wonder. At the very commencement of the piece, a servant going out had left the door partly open, and as she played, we who were nearest the passage strained our ears to listen to a plaintive echo which to us appeared to come from some room below, and sounded a low accompaniment as on a distant piano to the instrument we heard beside us. Soon others in the room heard this and began to murmur approval, but those who caught a glimpse of the pale lifeless face, whose eyes never glanced right or left, began to move uneasily. At the end of every passage the wailing but melodious symphony grew louder before it died away, and as the tone sunk lower, we all held our breath to listen. I especially, who felt I knew not what, was trembling violently, though my limbs seemed numb and I was rooted to the place where I stood, with my eyes fixed on the half-open door. Another minute or so, to me it seemed, and the door opened still wider as a sharp sudden blast of chill air blew through the room. I could see some of the ladies shudder, though they knew not why, and for a moment the light seemed to quiver, and a shower of sparks scattered from the grate around the hearth. All these things I saw, and yet seemed to have eyes, ears, heart, only for one thing. For there in the doorway itself stood the figure of my brother Franz. For a moment I saw his eyes rested on me, and I was about to spring forward to greet him, when he passed, rapidly gliding, not walking, across the room. Nobody seemed to see him. The rest of the orchestra were listening to some music and wondering at the strange significance. The guests were once more oppressed with who shall say what sensation beneath which they cowered into silence. Another moment, and the figure stood beside the chair where it had so often stood before. I knew now that I alone of all that company saw it, and though the skin of my flesh seemed to turn to a film of ice, I said to myself, Franz is dead. Lord George had been mending the fire. Now he looked up, and his face worked and changed from purple to white and back to purple again, as he too saw it, and for a moment gasped in dismay. Stills of her harmony of the music went on. The vile accompaniment grew louder and louder, till when it seemed to burst into a final chord, the lady, Adeline, her arms relaxed, her eyes wildly gazing, turned as if at a sudden summons, and with a great cry covered her face with her hands. Lord George had taken one irresolute stride forward, with his hand raised as if to strike, 
but something in the figure before him stayed him halfway. Evidently disbelieving his senses, he clasped his hand to his forehead, rushing forward, struck out wildly, but as he did so, he fell down, as to all it seemed insensible. The form of Franz was gone. As a violent crash of broken strings turned to discord the last bar of the music and the room beneath. Full of wonder at the cause of the strange and sudden prostration which had come upon both the Lord George and the high-bred Adeline, the guests ran hither and thither in a sort of bewilderment, with upon them a strange uneasiness as of those who have been near death unknowingly. Pale and seeming lifeless, Adeline was carried upstairs by the servants, and a doctor was already busy unfastening the collar and bathing the temples of the Lord George. For me, I went down to the supper room, for the table was laid with rich viands not to be eaten that night, for the guests were already departing hurriedly. I went for a moment to the piano which stood there and tried to open it, but it was still locked, and so I bowed down my face upon it and wept for my dead friend. Presently there came down to me others of the band who, having heard the strange accompaniment, spoke of it as a capital effect, as though of an arrangement novel and ingenious. But presently came a servant with a commission from somebody to open the piano, which, having done by means of a piece of wire, I saw that the broken strings lay coiled together in a tangled mass, and that entwined with them lay a long, crisp curl of dark brown hair. Soon the last carriage wheels were heard cleansing the gravel, and with the last guest I too departed, leaving as I sought desolation, if not death, behind me. Even when I reached my lodging, I found there for me a letter written by Mina, and bidding me come quickly, for that Franz was sinking fast. It bore the date of two days before, and I knew in my innermost soul that to him the end had come before I could speak farewell or hold him to my breast. Still I prepared to go next morning, leaving my address again behind me in case of any inquiry being made. In that little light pleasant room at the hotel where Master Schwartz and Mina lived, lay my dead brother upon the low bed all hung with sturdy piece of white lay there so pale and thin, but with such a life look still in his face that I almost expected him to breathe again, or to take up the little nosegay which lay upon his heart and offer it me. For a long time I sat there undisturbed in such grief as does the soul of a man good. Better feelings and holier thoughts were stirring me within, and yet, as I took up his white transparent hand and held it to my lips, I repeated to myself that Lord George or I must die. He had been sinking rapidly for two or three days before his death, I heard, had sometimes been heard to talk in his sleep as if he was speaking to me and called me Dear Brother Emile. How my heart broke into tears. Had kissed his foster mother, Unmina, as though with the knowledge that the end must soon come, and near the last fell into a trench which seemed so like death that only the motion of his thin fingers on the coverlid, he seemed to fancy he was playing, gave token of life. In five days he was to be buried, and as he had fewer affairs to settle, his effects being left to her mother, the time hung sadly with us all. Mina, too, seemed to have become preoccupied, and every day went out at the same time and stayed for two hours, refusing to let me accompany her. 
but this I wondered not at, for I knew that she had a lover in Max, a Sioux lieutenant, and my most good friend, to whom, however, she would give but little hope of speedy marriage, as he himself had told me months before. Now when I spoke to her of him, she looked scarcely pleased, but gloomy, then, taking my hand, burst into a passion of tears, and said that all depended on one event of which she could not speak to me, whether she married Max or not. Her lover was a fine burly fellow, and the best swordsman in Ghent, for Franz and I had both learned from him the exercise of the saber, but now, from being a free laughing companion, he had grown so dull and taciturn that I saw some mystery was there, and asked him its meaning, to which he answered only by pressing my hand and bidding me wait. It wanted yet two days to the morning when poor Franz was to be carried to the grave, when late one evening Madame Schwartz came to me as I was sitting brooding over the fire in her little room, and said there was a fresh arrival at the hotel, a lady only and her maidservant. Wondering what with me this could have to do, I still saw that she was under some excitement, and when she asked me to come with her to see if I recognized a visitor, I knew what thought was in her mind. Taking me by the hand, she led me down the long corridor to an anteroom, where she bid me stay by an inner door, while she went into the apartment on which it opened. One glance was enough. Standing before the fire was a mirror reflected her pale, haggard face, for the high Miss Adeline, so worn and white that she seemed to have been suddenly old-stricken. The morning of the funeral was, in all things, heavy and mournful. The rain fell, plashing with melancholy sound upon the newly turned earth on my brother's grave, the winds sang dirge-like in the trees. Our little band of mourners, standing round that coffin in the quiet burial place, drew closer together as though to say, Who knows how soon another may be taken? Let us love each other, for who can tell which may be the next? Max, who had looked on death in more than one battlefield, wept most of all though he held Mina on his black craped arm, and I, who felt as if that grave was closing on me also, prayed in silence, but still I sought within myself, Lord George, or I must die. As I was so thinking, I felt her mother press my arm, when looking up followed her glance to a large tomb close by where we were standing, Half concealed by the tree which overshadowed it, stood a woman, dressed all in black clothes, a hood covering her bowed down head. And as the solemn words reached her, I could see that she shook with a violence of weeping. Till we had taken our last look and gone away, she stood there. Then I turned and saw her give the sexton and diggers money and they waited at a little distance, as she knelt beside the grave and let fall a reef of immortelles upon the coffin. In my heart I pitied her for all the ruin she had wrought, and wondering how it came that she was in Ghent alone, we went back to our home, where we learnt that strange guests had come in that day. Madame Schwartz soon made us therefore busy, and for a time Max and I sat alone smoking, but saying little, for a heaviness was in my heart, and upon Max there was a gloom which I had never seen before with him. It had grown nearly dark, and we still sat smoking silently as the shadows deepened, when Mina came in, and telling Max she wanted him, came up to me and, pointing a kiss upon my forehead, bade me to go out into the fresher air of the street. They went away together, she and Max, 
and I, going out, sold about the town on the quiet quays beside the canals, and in the quaint old streets which were so familiar to me. But even rapid walking hither and thither would not still the uneasy feelings which had hold upon me and I turned back again, thinking that I would sit for a time in the large cell of our hotel, and there drink some azimuth, myself to rebalance, and perhaps listen to the conversation of some chance acquaintance. Entering quickly, I took my seat near a place where I saw two or three men already drinking at one of the tables. I had not looked at them closely when I sat down, but on turning to speak to the waiter, I heard one of them make some remark in English, and, with my heart leaping in my throat, saw the speaker was Lord George. He then, and his two companions, were the strangers who had come that day to the hotel. I had conversed with the waiter in German, and, as there were no other visitors in the room, this party was speaking loud and freely in English. "'What bother you, George?' said one of the strangers. We little expected to have you again, and especially on such an errand. Why didn't the old gentleman come himself first instead of sending you as an ambassador? I came without his knowledge, replied Lord George, laughing with an effort that seemed to be painful. The fact is, we ought to be married in a couple of months, and I'm afraid this mania of hers may put it off, which would be very awkward for me, you understand, unless the old man would pay in advance. One of his companions laughed, and the other only shrugged his shoulders, and as he rose from the table to light his cigar, I saw his lips curl with an expression of disgust. "'How did it happen?' said he, when he again sat down. "'You have told us it was she believed that he was visited by the apparition of a man who had killed himself for her. But did I understand that you saw it, too?' "'It's a private matter, and I shouldn't inquire about it, but you yourself volunteered the information.' "'I know I did,' said Lord George. "'If I hadn't told it to somebody, I should have gone mad. "'The fact is, I don't know what came over us both. "'If it had been myself only, I should think it might have been Del Trim, "'though I never suffered that way. "'Anyhow, she did see it, and of a whole room full of people, "'we were the only two. "'Don't let's talk about it. "'I've no doubt it can be explained by some of the scientific people. "'Perhaps it was mutual sympathy, the same thought dwelt on by both of us at the same moment, "'and strongly affecting the brain to the point of optical delusion. "'That's my version of it. "'But the worst of it is, she takes the other view, "'and a pretty pass her superstition has brought her to. "'The worst of it is that the man really is dead. "'Who was he, did you say?' Oh, a musician, a fiddler, or something of that sort, but pretty well known here, I fancy. The way she should steal off without why or wherefore, and take only her maid with her to come to this hell after a dead man, I can't imagine. She's mad, I think. And you know where to find her? Devil a bit, I, I, I mean deuce a bit, upon my word. I mean to give up swearing and drink, too, if I can only get this affair settled. She's somewhere here, I know, and I want to find her out before the old man comes to take her home so that we may all go together. I suppose she'll be at some hotel. I begin to look after her tomorrow, and I shall let nobody know who I am. The landlady here knows, of course, but I shan't be likely to find any of the dead man's relations staying at the principal hotel, I fancy. Suppose you did. Well, I'd rather not. There's nobody here of his name at all events. My man's found that out. What was his name? Franz Wilhelm. I expect he belonged to a low lot, as these musician fellows do, and he himself was a sniveling beggar, trying, as I found out afterwards, to get up a regular love story between him and Adeline. Why the devil he wasn't kicked out of the house, I don't know. You did that, didn't you? Well, I did kick him, certainly. I had risen from my chair, my hands clenched, and my eyes on fire. And as a moment, and I should have dashed my fist in his face, when a figure sprung out from a table which had been hidden by a screen. All the blood rushed back in a cold torrent to my heart, for there, walking swiftly across the room to the table where the Englishman sat, I saw the form of Franz, not weak and emaciated as he had appeared in his life, but better knit, firmer, and with a fineness eyes that boded mischief. Before I could cry out or move, 
Lord George had overset the table, and even as he stood there gazing wildly before him, the figure had advanced at a bound and struck him full in the face, a blow which caused the blood to gush from his lip, at the same time crying, Liar and coward! This is no apparition, then. And half recovered, he seized a chair and would have swung it upon his assailant, but that his arm was held from behind in a grip of iron by a man in plain clothes, whom I recognized instantly as Max. Stop, said Max in German. This can be settled alone by the sword. Who the devil are you? cried Lord George. Let me go, I say. Who is he and who is that? Will somebody ask for me, for I don't speak their fun language. Franz Wilhelm was my brother, though not by birth and blood, and was as right goodly born as he, said the person who had struck him, in appeal to that companion of his whom had been listening. If either of you are of the English gentleman, you will tell him that, for it to me, he answers, what to-night he has said, and for my brother's death, by him caused in manner most foul. I knew now who it was, and though my brain was reeling, saw that there was a difference between this person and my brother. I have already said how great resemblance there was of Mina to Franz, and now when some of the clothes he wore, and with the disguise of a man upon her face, she was a living image of him so lately dead. Mina, Mina, I whispered as I rushed to her side and caught her arm. This to me, this to me. I have vowed to avenge our brother and have waited long. You must be mad to think of it. What can a girl like you do in a combat with a strong man? I will explain to these companions of this and take the quarrel on myself. Emil, she said with his quickening breath, keep me not from this or I will hate you to my dying day. You shall keep your vow, and avenge him by letting me keep mine. As to my knowledge of what is necessary for such a meeting as I seek, ask Max, who is the best swordsman and pistol-shot in Ghent, and who has taught me these many weeks, till he cannot blame my skill. That is true, said Max gruffly, but I have torn my heart with entreaties that she should not do this, have offered to fight him myself at any odds. She still knows no relenting, and we are here. We were standing while the two companions of Lord George seemed to reason with him, for he was as a man insane and ungovernable, swearing that he would fight there and then, or that he would not fight at all. To fight here would be impossible, said Max, for we should have the guard upon us, which is what the gentleman would most desire. He uttered with a bitter sneer, for he, like me, desired to take the affair upon himself, and yet dared not reveal that it was a woman who had sought it. I will fight him here, I said with sudden hope, with the understanding that the combat shall last but three minutes, and all of you shall help him to escape if I fall. Softly, softly, said the gentleman who had spoken before. I must say that, for the follower of a peaceful art, the heir Wilhelm came from a family of damn deal more ready to fight than is my friend here, but he will meet the gentleman who gave this blow, if with him I have any influence. Who will be your second, sir? He said, bowing to Mina and speaking in German. He is here, Herr Maximilian Faber, lieutenant of the Imperial Army, now staying in this hotel. Again, if it be the heir Faber of whom I have heard, and you are his pupil. George, you had better try pistols, he said whimsically with a grim smile. Uh, may I with you have a word apart, he said, beckoning Max aside. George, you will be good enough to leave this affair to me if I am to act as your second. I will join you presently in your room. Lord George then went out, and I would have gone with Mina, but she said in my ear, I am now at ease, for I know that Max will have sabers, and I mean not to kill the man, but for life he shall bear the mark and brand of the murder of our brother and the bully who was beaten by a woman. I should have killed him, said I. Better have left him to me. 
She placed a plump white hand upon my mouth as we reached to a chamber door, and on my lips I felt that the skin had been hardened into horn in the place where she grasped the saber. Good night, she said, kissing me, and see only Max before tomorrow. They were to meet at daybreak on one of the quays lying near the outskirts of the city, where the canal forms a sort of little triangular island, reached by a wooden bridge and quiet at all times, but in the early morning quite lonely. His friend is doubtful of him, I truly believe, said Max, and may heaven grant that he shall be the coward that he thinks him, for then will Mina be safe, and either of us can deal with him as I would that we could now. I will be with you in the morning, I said, pressing his hand. It may not be then too late. I would not go to bed, but uh, sat up in the sally until midnight, whence the house was closed. Then I took my cigar case and went out into the great stable yard and sat down on a bench, for any room with a roof seemed too hot and stifling for me, and I had to wait the coming of the morning. The place in which I sat was under the black shadow of a wall, and whether I slept I know not, but I suddenly became aware of two men standing near and talking in a low voice. I could not see the faces of either, but presently one of them went and brought a lantern. Then I saw that he was dressed in an English uniform of servant livery, and that the other was Lord George. "'You can't miss it, sir,' he said, giving his master a piece of paper. "'Keep the main street till you come to the canal, then follow the turnings, as marked here, and you will come to the stable. Well, he will be waiting for you with a fast horse and a chaise. I will bring the luggage on tomorrow. You have your passport.' Quietly, and with only his stick and a cloak over his arm, Lord George went out from under the archway of the stables, and so directly the servant had disappeared, I followed. That he was about to escape to me was evident, and I would there and then have come upon him, but for the thought of me his safety prevented me. He sped onwards, and I, for some time, kept him in view until he entered the lowest quarter of the city. Then, in the tangled streets, I lost him and stood irresolute whether to pursue or to go back. I decided on the latter, and had already turned, when I heard a great shout, which, repeated, was borne from the farther side of the canal near which I stood, and was followed by a splash. Thinking it could be but some drunken boatsman of the neighborhood, I kept on, and, as the day was breaking, hastened to tell Max of the flight of Lord George, but I knew from the hour that they must have left the hotel before I reached it, and so went forward to the place of meeting. There was Mina, dressed as on the previous evening, but by daylight less like our dead brother. She was pale and firm, and pressed my hand as I went up to speak to her. Only when I had told them of what I had seen did she fall in a fit of weeping which was interrupted by the times and the appearance of some workmen who were out thus early. We turned back again slowly, Max concealing the swords under his cloak, and Mina leaning on my arm, and were full of indignant surprise that the Englishman, who was to have been Lord George's second, had not appeared. Presently we saw a knot of people coming down the street towards the hotel and bearing something in their midst. At this time the diligence was discharging its passengers at the hotel, and as the crowd came up and turned into the courtyard, there was a confused mingling of workmen, bargemen, market women, and travellers, and as a moment when the people fell back to make way for the officers of police, then we saw what was the burden they carried. The body of a man found that morning in the canal, with a knife wound in his breast, and his pockets rifled of everything save his passport. My witch, said the officer, he is an English gentleman as the title of my lord. His servant had recognized the body as that of Lord George, and had caused it to be brought to the hotel. 
and now amongst the newly arrived was a white-haired old gentleman, who, when he heard the name of the murdered man, had fainted, while to him presently came down his daughter, a pale, worn lady, with a face full of sorrow, and dressed in deep mourning. These two went away together the next day. In twelve months, Max and me never married, and after going to the wedding, I came back to England. But I play not now at private assemblies, and once a year I visit the grave where lies my brother Franz, and keep a planted with soft mosses, which shall help to keep his memory green. End of section six.